Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope you had a great Christmas celebrated with your family. Hope you received your Christmas gift. Definitely, I did receive my Christmas gift on the morning of Christmas Day, but it was a very unexpected Christmas gift. It was my first official rebuttal. A few months ago, I had recorded this video that I called The Definition of God That Leaves Atheists Speechless. Well, this video immediately received some kind of interest from several atheists that jumped on my um, very tiny YouTube channel to comment. We had some discussion and then, as usual, after a couple of weeks, um, the video just stopped being shown by the algorithm and just died. Um, then, all of a sudden, Sunday morning, the videos on the views on this video just jumped and I started receiving tens and tens of doses of comments um, on the morning of Christmas Day. And I was wondering, what's going on? And soon I found out that this guy here called Logic, which is apparently one of the most popular um, 80s channel on YouTube, had picked up my video and had decided to officially create a rebuttal, not in one not in two, but in three parts. And this was the very first part. Now, I decided to watch the video, of course, in less like 30 minutes, and it just goes over the very first probably seven minutes of my brief video. Um, I was very disappointed. It's pretty boring. It goes over and over in circles around basically two or three points without even scratching the surface of the argument I'm making, um, the hundred, he has hundreds of thousands of, of followers, um, hundreds of those flocked my, my uh, YouTube channel immediately, dropping comments in a very aggressive way. I tried to respond to all of them. Um, but if you want to go and, and watch the first part, um, go ahead, do it um, again. It's, it's pretty boring. I'm going to tackle those two, three arguments that he keeps going in circle for half an hour. Um, right now, I'm going to try to keep it brief because really there's, there's really not much to rebut to the rebuttal. Um, I really hope part two and part three are going to be much more interesting. So I'm, I'm really curious to what uh, and, and looking forward to it. If I want you to believe a claim I've made, it's not your job to prove or disprove anything. I'm the one who wants your mind to change. I'm the one who has to put in the effort. The burden of proof isn't some transcendent property that gets applied or not applied to a claim depending on whether it's sufficiently silly or not. It's just a practical reality of human interaction. All right, so the, the whole part, first part, is around the burden of proof. Who holds the burden of proof? So on the ID side, you always, the, the, the default point is, okay, you make the claim that God exists, you have to prove it. You have the burden of proof. Sure, in a sense. Now, this video that I made was exactly to try to challenge this default point of view, which I believe is not correct. Why? Because the underlying assumption here is that atheism does not claim anything. Atheism just says, I don't believe your claim. What I'm trying to challenge here is this default process that atheism wins by default. Atheism is the no hypothesis. No, it's not. It's not. Why? Well, if you watch my video, you would have understood why. The definition of the God that I put there is exactly to challenge the atheist. Of course, it's a very minimal. It's a very minimal definition of God. But if we don't even agree on that definition, of course, there cannot be any other discussion on all the possible properties that this God may have. Now, the point is, is it true that atheism does not make any claim? Of course not. Atheism makes a huge claim, and that was the whole point of my video. If you define God as the cause of the universe, the uncaused cause of the universe, atheism translating to, I don't believe that the universe is caused by anything, which is a huge claim. It's not, I don't claim anything. It's a huge claim. Why? Because everything that we see in reality is caused by something else. And claiming that the universe itself is not caused by anything 
it's just a huge claim. You could say that's my position, but it's not something. It's not the no hypothesis. It's not the obvious thing. It's just an assumption. It's just your opinion. And my opinion that the universe was caused by something, but your opinion that is, is that it was not caused by anything, they are on the same level. It's not that I am making a claim and you're not making any claim. You're making a claim that is as preposterous as my claim. Okay? So this is the first thing. Uh, let me give you the example that I gave in my video again. If we go um, in and we're walking in the desert and we, and we see all of a sudden that, uh, you know, the, the, the pyramids are there and we've never seen the pyramids before. I and my friend are walking there. And my friend says, whoa, wow, where are these pyramids coming from? And I'm saying, well, I'm sure that some ancient civilization built it. And my, my friend says, oh, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe you. I think that they were always there and they will be always there. I'm like, How, why? Why in the world? Well, because they, they're there. Prove to me that somebody built it. Well, I, I don't know. I cannot prove that. I cannot, you know, I'm sure that those that build it are, 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 are dead. I, I mean, I don't have a, a, a video recording of that building, but it's pretty obvious that somebody built it. Oh, no, 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 no. The proof, the burden of proof is on you because you're claiming that somebody built it. This is silly. The burden of proof is not on whoever makes a positive claim. The burden of proof is on whoever makes the silliest claim, the most unreasonable claim. And in this case of the of the of the pyramids, I am making a claim. Somebody built them, but my friend cannot claim that he's not saying anything. That he's just saying I don't believe it. That's not the null hypothesis. That's not the default. That's not the obvious explanation of what's there. His his claim that nobody built the pyramids and the pyramids somehow were always there is as preposterous as my assumption. They are exactly on the same level. So can we move on from this silliness? No, to say that it's logically necessary, or as you said, that it's logically impossible that it doesn't exist, is to say that for this God to not exist would be a failure of reality to align not with itself, not with any fact about itself, but with logical consistency. The non-existence of the thing would be a failure of logical structure. And to me, to claim that there's a being like this of any sort is a staggeringly ambitious claim. I have no idea how you would even set about demonstrating such a thing satisfactorily. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a staggering claim. Of course, it's a staggering claim. And I'm not claiming I'm proving anything. But the same exact thing can be said for the atheist position. The universe is there just because. Isn't that a staggering claim? To me, that is a staggering claim. That is a staggering claim. Why? Because the universe is not necessary. Why? Because it's made up of very contingent things. It's expanding at a certain velocity, at a certain acceleration. It has a certain content of matter, of energy, subject to certain um, physical laws that depends on particular parameters and so on and so forth. It's very contingent. There are many other universes that could be there, but they're not there. So, of course, by definition, the universe cannot be necessary in absolute terms. And the fact as asserting that something that doesn't need to be there, like the universe, but is there just because we know reason, is staggering as staggering, at least as staggering as imagining there is a there is a necessary cause to that universe. So you see, we're exactly on the same level here. No, in the universe, there's no two and there's no four. Two plus two equals four in math. If you would like to disagree, please point to two in the universe. Not two of something, because that's just those things. That's not two. No, point to two itself. Yeah, two doesn't necessarily exist. Two doesn't exist at all. That's what we mean when we say math is abstract. You're talking about an entity, an entity that existed before anything else that necessarily exists as an actual thing and caused the universe. Show me something like that, or at least give me a reason to believe something like that exists or can exist. This is the last objection, and to be honest, the silliest of all. 
he's basically picking up on the example that I gave about it. 2 plus 2 equals 4 being a necessary condition, just to illustrate what I meant by necessary in absolute terms. Of course, I don't believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is God. But the silly rebuttal is, show me where 2 is in reality. Not two things, show me 2. Now, this assumption, this way of thinking that if you cannot see something or touch something, if something is abstract, as he said, then it does not exist, is philosophical suicide, is hyper-materialism, that it's going to just destroy atheism. This was, I thought, it was already settled probably 500 years ago with Descartes, when, when Descartes started arguing against these hyper-materialist guys that denied even the reality um, of, of, of things. And Descartes basically said, well, since I think and since I perceive that I'm thinking, the only fact that I perceive that, that is a proof that I am something. I am a thinking thing, Descartes said. And you can say whatever you want. You can say that somebody is deceiving me, that my senses are deceiving me, that whatever. But as long as I perceive something, that something, even if it's totally abstract and not and totally subjective, you cannot say that it's nothing. <laughs> but here we are back again, 500 years later, a guy arguing that if something is abstract, then it does not exist. Of course, it does not exist in, as a material reality made up out of atoms and electrons and protons and energy, of course. But saying that it does not exist just because it's abstract, again, it's philosophical suicide. You know what else is abstract? Your thoughts are abstract. And if you really want to get to the end and bring your argument to a conclusion, you should argue that whatever goes around in your mind, that feeling that you have about thinking anything is actually nothing. Your thought process is nothing. It does not exist. So it's a total delusion that you have. And I can totally dismiss whatever you say, because whatever you say is based on some thoughts that are in your mind, that based on what you just said, do not exist. And that was it. That was pretty much it. Um, that's the end of the first 31 minutes of rebuttal, uh, of a one hour and a half, possibly, of rebuttal, um, of a simple definition. I consider that already a win. If I put out a simple video of 20 minutes where I just illustrate a very basic definition of God, and one of the most popular 80s channel on YouTube gets triggered to the point of creating a three parts rebuttal, each of, each of which 30 minutes long. Wow. Wow. That's a big win. Is there anything else in the video? Not, not really. Uh, a couple of places where he loses it, starts dropping insults, F words. Not that worth it. Um, some dominant fallacies, but I must say that he gave me very interesting interior decoration advice. I hope you like my plan here. Oh, one more thing, a suggestion. When I watch your video, I got kind of dizzy from this dancing that you keep doing. Can you keep still when you talk? I, I like you. I really like you. You're, I think you're a very good guy. You're a very fine guy. Please stay still. You got me dizzy. All right. Just joking. Looking forward for the next two rebuttals. I hope they're more interesting than your first one. See you later. Mm -hmm.